welcome everyone to this special lecture. We're very honoured to have Professor Lindsay Carter here from San Diego State University. Lindsay is an Emeritus Professor at that university and he's also an Adjunct Professor at AUT University. So as part of the ISAC course, uh, he is delivering this lecture on somatotype. So welcome Lindsay and thank you. Thank you very much, Patria. Great to be back here again. I hope you can get through my presentation, and I hope I can get through it too. I don't practice as often these days, but uh, I take a look at it, and I think all the slides will make sense eventually. Then. But you do have the, uh, you don't have the other They should have that with them so they can scribble notes, thank you. But uh, I, I hope this uh, goes well. And I wonder how many of you have a Scottish ancestry? There is a story <laughs> from way back that I learned when I was a student. And the medical school at the University of Edinburgh is one of the oldest in the world. And this student was in the class of the professor who was teaching there. And the professor noticed that this boy, amongst this group of 50 or 60 students, didn't take any notes. Everyone else is scribbling down everything the professor said. So the professor decided that he would talk to this boy. So he said, Laddie, he said, why are you, you know, taking notes? And the boy says, I don't have to, sir. I've got my grandfather's. <laughs> <laughs> so things didn't change for a long time. But anyway, we've, we've got PowerPoint now. So, so we hope we'll go a little bit more smoothly. And somebody here from San Diego State? San Diego State? Yeah. You'll recognize this one. I, I do, I love it. <laughs> okay, so uh, <coughs> I'm going to do a presentation on the somatotype method. Uh, just a little correction there. The department is actually the School of Exercise and Nutritional Sciences, so you administrators know how that kind of thing works there. Okay, what we're going to try and do here is we're going to go through the level one, two, and three uh, Isaac course requirements so that you'll have the total picture, but uh, I'll try and uh, put things together for those. You're level three, is that right? Yeah. So you've had some of the smatter type stuff before. Basically, what we uh, will attempt to do here, of course, pretty straightforward, the smatter type concept, the three components, calculate the components using the equations, the rating form, plot the somatotype on a somatochart. When we go to level two, in addition, we need to understand the 3D nature of the somatotype, calculate the statistics, and understand what SAD-SAM means, SAD and SAM, and <coughs> calculate those. We'll get to that. Level two, in addition, understand, understand photoscopic ratings. So this means the ratings from the photograph itself, uh, with or without the anthropometric data. Calculate the somatotype, SAD, applications of somatotyping to such things as body image, sports performance, and health. And it's not limited to others. So we go back to short history review here. Hippocrates in the fifth century talked about the habitus apoplecticus. And this was the short and thick person, and the only other kind of person was a long and thin person, the habitus physicus. So two categories, you fall into one or the other. Which one are you in? <laughs> Pretty limit, right? Not much there. Then uh, William H. Sheldon, uh, he created the term and the basic concepts of somatotype in 1940 and through the 50s into the early 60s. That was the method. One of the people that worked with William Sheldon was Barbara Huntman Heath. You can see down here. And I linked up with her in the early 60s. And she was unhappy with the Sheldonian concept. It was very limited. It was genotypically oriented, 
but they had no information about a genotype. So this was very problematic, and so uh, we shifted to, and uh, wrote our first article way back in 67, and as you can see, we wrote the book Carter and Heath in 1990, and pretty much since then, uh, everyone has used our methodology, which we'll get to. There's Barbara, another later. As I said, she was unhappy with Sheldon's work as she worked with him, and she had a different concept, genetic to the presence of work. And this is uh, the book that we have, and we have copies of that here in the <coughs> archive of life. So the first thing you, you have to get in your mind is that it is a gestalt or an overall old view of the physique. Raising ahead here, sorry. Uh, so, we okay, sorry. Uh, <coughs> so it's an overall rating of the physique in terms of these of the terms of the <laughs> Just lost my <coughs> manipulation there. So, uh, relative adiposity, musculoskeletal robustness, and linearity. So, thinking of the physique in those simple words, it is based on the anatomical model of body composition. So, we're not talking about cells here, we're talking about what you can see if you dissect the body, the basic anatomy. So it reduces a large number of measures or visual perceptions that you see in a person to a simple three number rating. Now, so we've got the shape and the composition of the body independent of height. Now that's important because you're all of different heights. So what's the best way to compare you? Make you all the same height. Now we do that mathematically squash you down or stretch you out, but we do that in a general way and you can think of it in your own mind as to how to bring that person to the same height or stretch this one out. But that's the way the ratings are made. It tells us what kind of physique we are working with. And if we want more detailed questions about composition, even down to the cellular level, we have to use completely different methods. The somatotype is not in that direction. <clears throat> so, quantification of the present shape and composition of the human body. That's the simple definition. It's expressed in a three number rating representing endomorphy, mesomorphy, and ectomorphy, respectively, and always in the same order. The most frustrating thing is that you find an article by somebody and they flip them around. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, awkward and difficult, and you just can't do that. So here's the basic definition. Endomorphy, the relative adiposity of a physique. So what, what is adiposity? Let's just think of it very simple ways. If you take the skin off, the next layer you usually come with somewhere in the body is the adipose tissue. And we're not talking about fat. That's within the adipose tissue. So we're talking about the gross anatomical structure, and when you're doing skin folds, that's basically what you're grabbing, the adiposity. The skin is within, so we call it skin folds. Mesomorphy, the relative musculoskeletal robustness of a physique. So what does that term robustness tell us? Well, basically, you know, how bulky the person is made up, sorry, the tissue is made up of the skeleton and the muscles. So that is the mesomorphy. Notice we've got the term relative in each of the definitions. This means what we just referred to, everyone is seen as at the same stature. And we'll, we'll come to what that is later on. So ectomorphy is the relative linearity or slenderness of a physique. So again, how shrunk down is the person compared to the great big bulky person? So the low endomorphies of the big bulky person, sorry, ectomorphies of the big bulky person, and the very linear ones are the long distance runners, some of them. 
So this concept of linearity is a very simple one, but sometimes people have trouble with it. I think this is the easiest way to explain it. If the person is round like a ball, we've got zero linearity, basically, and high linearity, like the pencil. High mesomorphy, strip the skin off, and you've got and the adipose tissue, and you've got the musculoskeletal development. Rate the somatotype and it's three number rating, endomorphy, mesomorphy, and ectomorphy, always in the same order. I can't emphasize that much. Not people get it all mixed up there. And so, you know, every time you see a 153, it's endomorphic, mesomorphy, In general terms, we use half unit increments from one half to 16 plus with a question mark. Why do we have that at the top, top end of the scale? What does that mean to you? What do you think of it? It means the scale is open-ended. So if we find someone who's even higher on the scale, we give them a 17, or 17 and a half. We'll see what the ranges are after the best one. So we see that the observed values for each component this is referring to what we've seen in the world literature and our own work, for example. Endomorphy, one half rating to 16 plus. And again, we don't have any good examples of that. Mesomorphy, half to 12, but it can go higher than that. Ectomorphy, half to 12. Why do we have half at the bottom end of the scale? Because everybody's got something of each of these three. Can't be round like the ball. Although independent. <coughs> but you meet you can be close to it. So. so we can give some quantitative <coughs> values to these by looking at this scale here. Low, half to two and a half. So if you just want a general statement about the physique, you can use these things. Three to five is moderate, five and a half to seven is high, seven and a half and above, extremely high. So we've got a, a verbal uh, statement there that will give us some information. Now, not everyone is perfectly formed. And we have a name for this, we call it dysplasia. And literally, it's bad shape or form. And somatotyping refers to the disharmony or unevenness of the three components di distributed throughout the body. So think about that for a moment there. Different regions. Simple example, you've got some guys, for example, extremely mesomorphic in the upper body, but they've got spindly little legs. Or the opposite. Someone's got a lot of lower extremity development and very poor upper extremity. So that's dysplasia, it's an uneven. Uh, in adiposity, same thing. Some people will have their adiposity up here. And others will have it down here. More on the legs, less on the legs. More on the arms, or less on the arms. So there's uh, that kind of distribution in the anatomical regions of the body. So <coughs> I'm going to throw in some things in. This, this is uh, pretty ancient now, but does anyone know who this famous bodybuilder was? Is Scott Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of California. <laughs> <laughs> Just show you, no limitations, guys. If you've got muscles, I mean, you can do anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is not the somatotype pose, so we'll be coming to that. But he was a 112 1 in competition, and that is extreme mesomorphy, right? Right there. Way up there. Yeah, of course, he looked like that. Dinka tribesman from the Sudan, one and a half, three and a half, five and a half. It looks like his spear. <laughs> we don't know what the rating is here. It's almost impossible to get a somatotype rating on a person like this. Obviously, very overweight, obese, you can use those terms, obviously, more than 50% body fat and certainly extreme ethanol. 
So this would be a way up at the 16 plus something or something like that. Uh, we probably can't rate it. You know, we just might get an estimate. We might propose it. You know. <coughs> but another heavy kind of athlete, the sumo wrestlers, and uh, <coughs> some of these have, some of them have more endomorphy or relative adiposity than they have muscularity, but their muscularity or mesomorphy is still very high, but it's covered up by the fat or the adipose tissue. And so you have trouble getting at the mesomorphy. What about ectomorphy? Just looking at it, immediately round like a ball. So it's got to be extremely low in ectomorphy. Now, ladies, which one of these are you closest to? Think of your own body. <laughs> uh, this is a gr great series of photographs. I've got um, two or three shots of this from Howard Schultz. He came out with a whole book on these things on, on athletes. And uh, these are in the uh, 1990s, basically. You might recognize some of the names, but immediately you look at the shortest and you kind of figure out what does she do, you know. So, but uh, <coughs> she was a figure skater. Probably guessing, obviously, Lisa Leslie was in basketball. Guys, which one are you closest to? Not in performance, you know, but at least in terms of physique. And so we've got a range from a basketball player on the left here, gymnast here, and then another basketball player over there. We've also got football players, basketball gymnast, marathon runner. Uh, she had forgotten how to pronounce that there, but he was, he was very good. He was in the two, five to two ten range. <coughs> okay. So we've been talking about this about that, but how do you get, how do you do the rating? And uh, there are two basic methods on the combination of the two. And as you can see here, we've got the photoscopic somatotype from standardized photographs. And we'll come up with those in a moment. So you can rate from looking at the person in a standardized posture. The anthropometric somatotype, which is the basic field method, if you take 10 anthropometric variables, you can calculate the somatotype. And this is the most commonly used method. For example, in this course, you learn how to do that. You should be able to do that because that's the basic method. The criterion method is a combination of the two. And we have two criterion readers here, Dr. Patria Hume and Dr. Kirk. And so uh, they took a course for me a few years ago, and they're certified. And so is Kelly, right? Kelly is a We ran the course on Australia. They didn't have to come to San Diego. But, uh, Get in your mind that you can look at a photograph and rate a person. You can take measurements and rate the person, or you can combine the two, which is obviously the criteria. And so here are some standard somatotype poses, a three-view photograph of the person, front, side, and rear. Uh, we don't insist that they be nude. Uh, and uh, these are some extremes from the literature, 10 and a half, 4, 1 half, 2, 7 and a half, 2, and a 1, 2, 8, oh, 6. Um, so you can see the basic thing, and this is what we do when we do the photographic somatotype. And it has to be standardized. You can't have just some standardized or something like that. You standardize it so that they look like everybody else in that pose. And this is a man from the Manas Islands, one of uh, Barbara Heath's. Uh, she did a lot of field work in the Manas up in New Guinea. And uh, this is one of the village elders there, and he's a three, eight, one and a half. Back to the Nilots and <coughs> the Upper Sudan again. So here we see. 
tall, light, high height weight ratio, one and a half to eight. So you can see, just think back to the other two, completely different physiques, so they've got different numbers. Kind of a mid-range, four and a half, three and a half, three. So, how do we get the anthropometric somatotype? This is one where we do the body measurements, the kinds of things that you're learning, and you, so you're already expert in the hope. So, pretty simple, stature, body mass, and we take the clothing mass off there, skin folds, four skin folds, two breadths, two girths, maximum tens for the upper arm, and maximum for the standing calf curve. So, uh, pretty simple set of measurements, and we can deal with these in various different ways, which we'll go on to now. Perfect focus, but we don't need that. But uh, in essence, this is the standard rating form that uh, we've used for decades, if you like. And so you take the measurements, and you enter them on the form, and you can calculate out on the form the actual rating, for example, with some of the skin folds corrected for stature. You circle it in the column here, and you drop down that column, and you circle one and a half. down the bottom here. Similarly with uh, the mesomorphy, we've got stature on the top there, so visually this is a good exercise because you take each of the measurements, height, circle, circle there, there's the two girths, uh, the upper arm and the calf, and the biceps and, oh, sorry, both ones, correct me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, sorry, the first two are the bone, bone widths over there. There we go. And these two are the biceps girth and the calf girth, and they're corrected for the accompanying skin fold, and so they're circled over here. Now, the nice thing about the anthropometric form is that already you can see something. If this is stature, and mesomorphy is relative to stature. If all your measurements are to the right of stature, what does that tell you? Their musculoskeletal development is high relative to stature, so you know that the rating is going to be above four. Kind of skip the thought process there, but if they're all, they average under the height, the person is a four in reason. And you can see this person, the average is over to the right, and uh, you do this calculation, you've got to do something over here, I won't go into that at the moment. But you do that calculation, and here is the four, and that's the five and a half over there. So you've got a diagram, if you like, of the measles morphe as well as the others there. And, and it's, it's very simple, it's not as complicated as it might look initially. <coughs> and so for uh, ectomorphy, you've got the weight, and you've got the height up here, and you do the height over the cube root of weight, and that gives you the value for ectomorphy, so you circle that there, and uh, that, that should be circled there as well, but that's a three. So a one and a half, five and a half, three. And so uh, I don't expect you to you know, follow all those steps just like that. Because we can do it easier, as we'll see in the bit here, by putting them into the equation. But pictorially, that gives you kind of the shape and composition of the person in terms of some appetites that you can. But most of you, we don't want to bother with that. You know, you say, oh, I just want to punch it in the money. Get the answer, put it into a program. But uh, you will, you should understand what these are like, and I'm not going to go through them in detail, but obviously the endomorphy must have the sum of the skin folds because that's the assessment of the adiposity. So that's what those are referring to there. These are the equations that will, uh, based on the, the, the measurements, but if you think of that top section of the uh, rating form, that's essentially what this equation is doing. It's just averaging all that stuff out there into an equation so you can see it. 
and some of the skin folds here. The only uh, problem here is this developed way back. We didn't include the calf skin fold. I'm not going to with a big explanation, but at that time we followed another investigator, uh, Richard Parnell, and he used the summer three, so we, we kind of stuck with that. But uh, that's not the ideal way. Some of the four would actually be better. But don't worry about that now. So anyway, you can see that we can put some of the skin folds into the equation and we come up with a uh, rate. Now, uh, part of this slide is borrowed from Tim Olds in uh, South Australia. He did some nice graphic stuff and so on. But uh, essentially, this is saying the same thing. Measure the sites, calculate some of the skin folds, correct for stature, and apply the formula. Reason Morphe. This is the basic equation. As you can see, a kind of a weighting uh, number humerus breadth, femur breadth, corrected arm girth, corrected calf girth, and the height of our stature. And so again, this is <coughs> measure the sites, correct the girths, apply the formula, uh, we'll ignore the rental ones, and so a uh, student in, in uh, Simon Fraser University came up with a little bit of a wrinkle in it there. But, uh, and I was the external examiner, it was good, good study, it just kind of dropped <laughs> from the wayside. We never got it published or anything, so uh, if you ever come across a reference to it, it probably be just referencing his thesis and not any publication. Uh, so ectomorphy, this is a bit uh, simpler maybe than the others here. Height divided by the cube root of weight, we call it the HWR or the height weight ratio. And then ectomorphy, in this range here, they want you to use a different equation, and if it's so low that there's no sense in calculating it, you just give it a zero point one, and that person would be round with the ball. Now uh, you can see that you use a different equation according to the height weight ratio. That's simply because it's a curve linear relationship, but with most of the curve right at the uh, low end. From then on, it's a relatively straight line. So that, that's what that signifies there. So again, height and mass is all we need. Calculate the high weight ratio, apply the formula, and again, the rental uh, variant there. I just mentioned it on the side, but uh, don't you don't you don't bother with it. Now, one of the things that we do with somatotype, uh, is that we plot it on a somatic chart. And the concept that you need to keep in mind here is that the somatotype is three-dimensional. Plotting is actually three-dimensional, but 90% of the time we use it as a two-dimensional page chart. But the concept is worth understanding. So as we can see here, we're collapsing three variables into two for the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. Pretty simple and straightforward. But when you look at this, make sure you can see that this is a sphere, and this is back into the sphere. Sometimes visually it doesn't quite uh, show up as well. So we're looking at the three coordinates, if you like, for the somatotype. And so here's the endomorphic corner, here's the mesomorphic corner, and here is the ectomorphic. This is 711, 171, 117. Right in the middle is 444. And so you have to look at it here, and it's going back and away from you in 3D as part of the total sphere. But, of course, we're not going to carry these spheres around with us and look at them. We're going to plot it on a two-dimensional graph. And this is the kind of thing it is, the two-dimensional somatic chart based on the xy coordinates, y here and the x here. And we use the component values to calculate uh, where that somato plot will be. So 
what we've got with some other type, we can put it on here and compare it to where other people are. And so this is the grid. We don't use it in that form. We use it primarily in this form, or <coughs> like the one we're going to show you where we've got the scales on the outside. And so once we know the x, y axes, we calculate them out, and we just find the spot for our person not right there. So for example, here are 15 ballet dancers, and this is their savanna chart. As we go through examples of these, you'll see the different groups of athletes, or other kinds of groups, are in quite different places on the savanna chart. But it's important to use this. Uh, one of the things that I criticize when I get to review an article often People just have statistics and all kinds of fancy statistics, and you never see where the somatotypes are related to each other or to the groups that they've studied. And this is a very good visual aid for most kinds of things. So already you understand the basics of, of the somatotype, but already you can kind of see, hey, these, this is a pretty tight-knit group, if you like. Small distribution, and of course they are their mean is about here, but this is a pretty tight group. We'll be looking in a few seconds here at other groups that are all over the place. If you want to be a ballet dancer, though, you better be in here. You don't want to be away up here. You'll never make it. So we get into a whole other area, which I'm not going to deal with, that sports selection. This is a major year. So here's one of the dancers here, three and a half, three, three and a half. Just for convenience on these, I've got 0.5 as the half instead of the half the fraction thing. Excuse me, so can you just explain the difference between half and 0.5? When you use a half or when you use 0.5? Um, it's arbitrary. When you write it out, you can use a half or you, or you can use 0.5. To me, it doesn't make any difference. But traditionally, we would use the half. But once you start doing stuff with the computer, you're going to have 0.5 points. <laughs> now, we can summarize things about this amount of type by putting them into groups that have some commonality. And so that you don't have to perhaps even remember what the mean amount of type is. You kind of say, well, people in this group, they're all endomesomorphs. That's the kind of terminology you can use. So with similar relationships between the dominance, the magnitude of the components, we can group them into categories. We have 13 categories, but these can be simplified into four. And so diagrammatically, here, here's what we have. So we can label these areas of the somatotype. The mesomorphic endomorphs are all in this sector here, and they can come way out here if you have them, or the bodybuilders can be way up there, you know, Bal balance reasonable, etc. The ballet dancers, we're down here, for example. We have a central category where everything is within a 4, 4, 4, plus or minus a, <coughs> a, a, one unit on each of those, for example. And again, the endomorph, the 171 is here. Sorry, the 711, correct me. 711 one, up, up, one, 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 seven, one up here. Getting confused myself. 117 one, down there is the extreme. So we'll keep referring to some of these here. So these are the names. And I want you to pay attention to how these are formatted here. Uh, we've had a lot of trouble with international uh, people writing articles and getting nouns and adjectives mixed up. So. The noun is the capital N. The adjective is the lowercase letter. So, this is an endomorph. What kind of endomorph? An ectomorphic endomorph. So this tells you that the second highest number is what? Ectomorphic. Okay? So the highest number is endomorph. And so on down the line. So if we take this A mesomorph and an endomorphic mesomorph. 
in contrast to an ectomorphic. So in other words, you expect something like a 4, 5, 1 for an endomorphic reasonable, but a 1, 5, 4 would be an ectomorphic reasonable. You don't have to try to win. But if you look at the semantics, you can see that it, it all fits pretty good. So if you want to generalize about a group, this is a very convenient verbal way of bringing out that difference. And so these are just some examples, so you can match them up. And so some odd ones, you know, you're not quite sure of a 613. What the heck is that? Okay, what's the highest one? Endomorph. What's the second highest? Ectomorph. So it's an ectomorphic endomorph. Know something about Spanish. In Spanish, what do they do? Noun followed by the adjective. So this is where we get mixed up because they flip the things there, and so I've had to correct people, you know, in reviewing articles and things like that. And so <coughs> they they would say uh, mesomorpho ectomorphica. So they put it down like that. But in English, it's the other way around. It's an ectomorphic reason. We can simplify it in four categories for some groups. If most of them fall in the middle there, we have a central distribution. Or endomorph, endomorphia is dominant, mesomorphia and ectomorphia more than half a unit lower. In other words, it's going to be a full unit lower, as in the five <coughs> Mesomorph, mesomorphy dominant, endomorphy and ectomorphy are more than a half year lower. So you can sort these out into four major categories, and particularly with a large distribution, this might be a good descriptor. Or you might describe the group as being going from endomorphic mesomorph to ectomorphic mesomorph. So that's kind of a verbal way of summarizing what. So again, it's just a look at the somatotype. It's a two-dimensional way of representing the location of a somatotype in three-dimensional space. So we come back to the sphere again, and this is the only part that we have the somatotype. It's one eighth of a sphere, center at zero zero zero, which is way back there. In this case, tilted towards the viewer. So 3D to 2D, if you like, endomorphy three. Uh, sorry, a 362. Where do we plot that? And basically, you can just follow the lines. You start from the. Sorry, technique again here. <laughs> so what do we do? Three units on the ectomorphic axis. Remember, this is the one down here. Six units on the mesomorphic axis. That's the one that goes up there, and parallel to this one here, two on the ectomorphy axis, and that's where the three, six, two is from. So this is kind of what the computer has to do to go through to get to that particular geometric point. And uh, fortunately, you don't have to do it quite that way, but it gives you a good understanding of the uh, 3D concept of the somatotype. And this is a, uh, just another example of that in a simple way here, looking at it here, plotting with 3, 6, 2 again, 3, 6, 2, rotate it around, and that's where the 3, 6, 2 is kind of plotted. By rotating it around, I mean, you're taking the left hand over there and you're kind of turning it around into a two-dimensional uh, view. And you can do, look at the same kind of thing there, and I'll just skip on. An important measure is how do we describe the difference between two somatotypes? You're over there and your friend's here. How far apart are you? Well, the somatotype attitudinal distance will calculate that in 3D as a rule, in three dimensions. So this is a very useful one. And this is the measure that we use a lot in the analysis programs that we have for somatotypes. So we're really dealing with them uh, as distances between two plots.
wants. It could be distance from a mean or distance between two people or uh, an important application is changes in somatotype over time. And this has been uh, well used in growth studies of children. Starting here and, uh, and follow them and you can see which ones change the most, which ones change the least, how they change direction in their somatotype. So uh, this is printed out in your handout so you don't have to mess around with it. But this is the difference between two somatotypes. And the attitudinal mean is the average of all of the somatic plots from the mean somatic plot. So now you can have a measure of how spread out the distribution is. How spread out was that ballet distribution? It wasn't very much, was it? It was kind of a tight cluster. But for some other activities or populations, they might be all over the place. So they'll have a huge dispersion so that's what the attitudinal mean can summarize for you. And then you can look at the difference between two groups by comparing their SMD or the distance between the two means. So you can see how far they are. <coughs> so that will come out uh, statistically. And so uh, generally what we do, we round them to a single decimal place, no, no need to to 3.152 or something like that. But that's meaningless to go way down there. So one decimal place is all you need and for plotting it's there, etc. You can go to the nearest half unit. So you round these to the nearest half unit. That's a three, five, two and a half. Find that on the somatic chart you can point to. But of course you can not plot them too. So uh, for the rating form there the nearest half unit. The compo frame. I find this a very useful one. It's a departure from the somatic chart itself. But as we'll see in a moment here, it's, it's a very good illustration of how the components lie in relation to each other. So we can compare two or more somatic individuals or the line graph is constructed with the three components, x axis against the component ratings y-axis. And there's nothing complicated about it. Very simple. So we have our three components here and we have the rating value up here and so we can plot them, three components, and compare them directly and we can run a significance test by component and in this case these were high school and Olympic wrestlers and uh, California, the high school residents, and the significant difference was only in the mesomorphy, the relative musculoskeletal development, as you might expect. High school wrestlers, not nearly as mesomorphic or developed uh, as the Olympic wrestlers. <coughs> and there was also a significant difference in the ectomorphic component, but none in the endomorphic. So, simple interpretation. We've got low adiposity, both groups. One group's higher in mesomorphy, the other's lower. But because of that higher mesomorphy, now this reverses the ectomorphy because they've got more bulk, if you like. And so here we have the Olympic wrestlers are lower of ectomorphy than the high schoolers. Part of this is accounted for in their different mesomorphia or musculoskeletal development, just as you might expect. Uh, we call this a compogram, it's a, <coughs> and the last one was too. But this is just a, a simple comparison again of uh, world-class female athletes, basketball, synchros, Debbie knows all about that, she was on that project. <coughs> uh, and uh, volleyball, water polo, and underwater hockey. Who knows what underwater hockey is? That's a few, okay. This study was done by Mark, my, Michael Marshall Jones in New Zealand at the World Underwater Hockey Championships. All right, well, we'll leave it there. But anyway, it's a strange sport. Uh, but you can see that basically you can compare groups simply uh, 
you wouldn't have uh, the standard deviations here because of the mix of that too much, but you can compare the groups and plot the standard deviations of the beans there as well if you want to get a, a good uh, pictorial thing. But I think that the only difference here on the females is this is the interesting one here, that the volleyball players are much more ectomorphic and less mesomorphic than the this one. Sorry, um, returning to that previous slide uh, with wrestlers, if, if you're looking at a sport that potentially has multiple weight classes, is this going to standardize for weight classes? Uh, well, well, you can do a plot for each weight class. So you could do... Or you could superimpose them all on the one, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can do some. I just have those two weights. And, and that's the total of the weight classes, so it's a bit of a mixed average. Uh, and here in male sports, rugby, soccer, volleyball, water, polo, and underwater hockey. And uh, the underwater hockey guys are the volleyball players. This is the more male characterization. Right? So they are more visible than they are. All right. Well. Now that you've got the concepts, you can just look at these sonata charts and you know exactly what they show. You don't have to give the numbers, so that's okay. So uh, <coughs> these are three extremes. I'll just pop those out to show you how varied the human race is. And uh, <coughs> regardless of gender, I mean, uh, we're not trying to compare the genders, but obviously, these females, minus males, this is the uh, New Guinea group again, and the Nilo males from South Africa, uh, from uh, Sudan. Thank you. And I drew a dotted line in here just to show that they were actually completely separate. Uh, back to a Sudanese, a 128. And you can see right away, you know he's highest in that. Have to be from the Sudan to be high in ectomorph. One, one and a half, seven and a half. And you kind of look at them and say they just don't have any muscle mass. Ten, four, one half. She's given a one half because she's very rounded. She's at the bottom of the high weight ratio scale. Twelve, five. Round like a ball for the most part. Certainly central. Uh, these are students from San Diego State <coughs> before Scott's time. Uh, but they're still the same thing. Uh, and uh, so we see the mean here 4.2, 3.7, 2.6. is right there. This is the distribution. And <coughs> these are not physical education majors, these are students in general exercise classes taking like, tennis, fitness, all kinds of things. Typical one here, four, two and a half, four. And she's low and reasonable in the middle there. Four, two, four. But she's more like, she's probably did a good job, I've done some other studies, as a fashion model. This is fairly typical of a fashion model. A bit more ectomorphic, but she could dress them almost and look good on the runway, right? That's what she does to it. Five, four, one and a half. A bit more endomorphic than this. These are males. Pretty widespread distribution there all over the place. Some quite ectomorphic ones, some endomesomorphic here. Three, three and a half, five and a half. He's a bit more reasonable. See that right away. Two, eight, one. Athletes, we can go through this fairly quickly here. Uh, this is the plots from the uh, male and female athletes of the uh, 1968 Mexico City Olympics and the Montreal 1976. I was on both projects there, and actually, looking back now, the amazing thing to me is that the we did an anthropometric and genetic study in 1968 in Mexico City. 
and that's still the largest study of Olympic athletes. If you can measure over 1,100 athletes, male and female. Montreal Olympics, we were about 475. There hasn't been anything of that large again. But just what you might expect there. And so if we separate out track and field, we get this nice linear relationship here, shot discus and hammer throws up here, as we would expect, long distance runners way down here and the others are doing the little. So I'm telling you, you know, he's a weight man, he's a discus thrower, long jumper. He's a middle distance runner. Uh, I won't tell you the whole story of this guy here, but he is <coughs> colleague of mine from San Diego State, ran marathons, and he ran the Boston Marathon. So you're all familiar with that. Started at 30 years of age, ran every year for 30 years, actually he's still running, and his time at the beginning was two hours and 30 minutes. After 30 years, this was his objective, he was 2 hours, 59, 35 or something like that. And the plot of the graph is almost a straight line all the way through. Amazing individual kind of uh, case study. And uh, it, it said he's still running, got some injuries, but he's running about 310 and he's 7 or 8 years old. Right now. Um, Female track and field athletes. We showed the males a minute ago. Here's the shot the discus throws out here, etc. Down to the limbs. Here's a discus thrower. High jumper. I think you've seen these. Big out on television. Sprinter. Female bodybuilders. Several studies. Balance means more, right in the middle. We somatotype some of the study later, but not this particular group here. But the average two, five, two and a half of this particular group. She was one of the top ones, one and a half, six, two. And this is that. Uh, me, I always joke that's me in my former life. <laughs> Well, this will be your next one. <laughs> Two, six, and she's the most mesomorphic that I've seen on the women, but I don't have good data. We did do a study in uh, uh, California there, and we saw some of this is the one there, and uh, she's a three, four and a half, three, but it was Fitness America. It was not like straight bodybuilding that they had to be more all around, but uh, she was quite typical of them there. And uh, male bodybuilders, <laughs> By now, you should know where they're going to be, way up the top. What's their main objective? Lose all that adipose tissue. In addition, bulk up the muscles. They don't care how linear they are. They want that mass thing. And here's way back to Arnold and his colleague there. This is from the study we did uh, <coughs> up in Long Beach. One and a half, ten and a half, one. Bodybuilders from the <coughs> amateur bodybuilders uh, championship in Egypt. Bill Ross and John Lawrence did this one ten and a half one, and now we're getting near the top of the scale here one thirteen one. Got no adiposity. <laughs> it's got to get from one, and uh, it's not linear because it's got so much musculoskeletal development. Not much skeletal that's unusual, perhaps, but the muscles, and you can see what's contributing to that high score. Okay, so now the types of gestalt, it's an overall view of the body, reduces a large number of measurements down to the three number, three numbers, I should say, general description. This is in your handout, so you've got these kind of references of what they did. But uh, I want to point out to you that uh, Monty Goulding in, uh, is he still on the south of the street? 
He's in Melbourne right now. But anyway, you can find him on the web. You don't have to go to Melbourne to find him right there. But uh, this is a very good program that happens to be in Oops. Got a Spanish explanation there. But it uh, does plumbing for you and everything and comes up with this stuff. So uh, uh, very nice. We'll give you the uh, statistics, some other plots, the categories, and can compare individuals and groups. And so this is what a plot looks like, a U.S. Uh, Australian soccer, and uh, me and a single player. And this is Sweat Technology. And uh, he's on the web, and uh, you can refer to these kinds of things in the, to the website as well, and uh, references. And this guy, Painted body and all, I call this the end, because that's the end of his body. 112 kilos. He's a bodybuilder. So thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, hopefully the information is useful. But your outline is all you really need to know, but I stress that somatotyping is vision, what you see, Hopefully you can convert that into some numbers that you can work with.